Good evening and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 57th take live from the Casa Cueva studios of Euless, Texas. This is Take 57 and I'm so, so excited to have all of you guys tuning in tonight. It's going to be a fantastic take. Another return guest, uh, one of my absolute faves uh, in the industry, uh, just a tremendous, tremendous gentleman. And yes, it's because we, uh, we share an affinity for the greatest sport on earth, that is baseball. But beside that, he is a fantastic gentleman uh, and a fantastic cigar guy. Uh, and he gave us an absolute amazing take on Take 21. So go back and check out the uh, the inst the replay on that if you guys didn't have a chance. Really unique. It wasn't really so much news. There was a it, it was a it was basically I wanted to focus on how he kind of got into the industry, and I thought that was a really unique story. Um, so definitely check it out. So take twenty one um, with our tonight's guest. So without further ado, I think that's the longest introduction I've given. So without further ado, I really am excited to welcome back Crown Heads Miguel. Shodell, Miguel, how you doing tonight? Uh, doing fantastic, man. Thank you for having me on the show again. Um, always very appreciative to be able to take the time out to talk cigars, talk baseball. Um, you're a wonderful guy, and uh, I always, I, I, I really enjoy these things. Oh, I and, appreciate I, it. and I like your Ebbetsfield flannel T-shirt, Paul Tuckett. You, to you totally, I did that just for you, man. You totally just pegged that. Like, with the, like it's even like not even the whole thing. I just saw Paul Tuckett, and I said, I know, I've seen that shirt before. <laughs> I've seen that shirt before. I waited. I didn't even get this at the store. So you're, I mean, you were the one. I Ebbetsfield flannels was on my radar, but like you were the one that were like really pushed me to like, hey, you got to check them out. And, and then I, you know, when I was going on my trip to Seattle, you're like, dude, you have to go there. You have to go there. I waited. Um, I waited about six months for this shirt because they didn't have it in my size. Like, mm -hmm. and I couldn't even get a larger size or anything. They just did not have my size. And so like, yeah, it's the, it's the Pawtucket clam eaters, New England. Great. Name. Great. Yes. So oh, gosh. I think it's, uh, it's circa, it's uh, circa the, late man i think it's like the 20s or something like that it's pretty it's pretty old yeah I love um that. and uh yeah and it that i was like oh i'm gonna totally rock my ebbetsfield finals in honor of you and then matching the maroon of my uh long perosa hat um so i think i think brian mcgee is officially probably just like sick of it at this point i every time someone comments on this hat or says something about this hat or asks me about it i tell the story i'm like you don't understand brian mcgee from crown heads will always be have a special place in my heart because he actually gave me my first cigar swag hat that really fits my head. Nice. Oh, I, I know. I know that about you. I know, <laughs> I know you have, you have some trouble up here. Yes, I do. Fits. I understand. It's ma It's, it's, it's massive Miguel. And it, it needed to be, it needed to be covered with cigar swag. And, and, and until, uh, you know, until recently where other brands have been able to, put out stuff where i've actually been able to you know fit into it this yeah. was this was uh this was nice man so i wore this all the time I and mean, it's it's still got some great color there's a little it's a little it, there's a little fade to it but a it's a uh, little love yeah a little it'll uh it'll always be uh uh a have a warm spot in my heart so i is that I a really little, appreciate it is that a little curve is that a little curve you put on your hat i put a little curve on my uh my new era 5950s um I don't, uh, I don't do the, I'm not rocking. I don't rock the flat bill like you've got going on right now. And I don't really crinkle them out. I do that on the, like the 39, the 39 thirties, the flex foots. Yeah, like flex I'll, 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 round, I'll round those out pretty hard, but on, um, I'm still pretty traditional on the 59 fifties. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do a slight, I'll do a slight round. Looks good. I, yeah. I wear, I wear the, I wear my hat backwards a lot too. Um, so it, it kind of it kind of kind of goes with it and everything. So, um, but uh, what we were talking about the interesting thing we were talking about with your hat before the show, I thought uh, what you were quick to point out and I thought was really interesting was the it's the CHC logo, and the really intricate and complex thing is the fact that there's you have to place two C's into it, yeah, two C's into the logo. Yeah, so it's got two C's and it's kind of two different fonts and obviously has the H. It stands for Crown Heads Court, which is one of our newer cigars that have hit the market, CHC Reserve 18. But what I liked what John Huber did 
was, and by the way, the style of that hat is meant to be very like 1920s, the flannel, the gray flannel with the black, which was so traditional in baseball and the Negro leagues and even a lot of the major league teams at the time. So this is very much with the black, um, you know, air holes and the black top. Um, it just looks really neat. And I love mm -hmm. the fact, but what's unique is, is that it's two fonts. It's two C's. Usually you'd stick with the same font, but you can't because there's two C's. They'd just be laying over each other. Right. Um, so I, I really like what he did. I thought he did a great job on that. And um, it's just one of my favorite hats to wear. And I get a lot of compliments on it. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. And I mean, like it, it, the thing about crown heads is their hats are, they're, they're always legendary. And I, I like I said, there's, I've liked almost nearly all of them and uh, and just the design and the care that kind of goes into the logos and everything is really, really, really fantastic. But speaking of C's and speaking of logos, I know you've been you've uh, this is kind of you are finally returned home. You've bounced around. You you had a, a fantastic weekend ca capped off by the great cigar events. But you also got to go to Reds Fest. Your beloved Reds uh, had their annual fan fest. Um, any uh, any stories from that you were really excited to 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 talk to any people we were nice to meet Anything? well it's, it's a two-day festival and it is the largest fan festival of any major league team outside of the all-star festival and we are almost the same size as the all-star festival so you could talk yankees you could talk dodgers you could talk astros boston you could talk any of the great big franchises we have the largest fan fest of any team in a major league. And our fan fest is just a schmidged under uh, the, the turnout of what all-star fest gets. So we, it's always a great time. Uh, you know, they have batting cages, throwing, uh, check out how fast you could throw a ball. By the way, I hit uh, 48 this year, 48 miles per hour, which is terrible because i got little leaguers next to me throwing See. in the 70s you know what i mean <laughs> so but you, were throw, you were just throwing your ephus pitch right that was just yeah. your that was just yeah, your breaking ball it was my breaking ball um and uh, it's always a good time because all the players are there are the owners the management there's you know swag there's games there's it's just a million things to do and there's literally there's, it's three levels and the, the very top level is for little kids, and there's huge playground that they build. So it's truly a family affair. It's truly something uh, that – I think this is maybe my seventh year going in a row. And um, I just – I love it, and it gets me excited for the, for the season. I have since – you know, I've relocated to Florida, and I'm near Tampa. And uh, – the Tampa Bay Rays has a fan fest too. Uh, I think theirs is in February, if I'm not mistaken. But I may even go check that out just to see what it's like. Um, I think you're gonna. Well, comparatively speaking, with and I, I do honestly mean with all due respect to the Rays, uh, they are a major league baseball club. But it, by comparison, I'm I guess compared to the Reds, I think <laughs> all of them are insufficient uh, compared to yeah, compared yeah to that experience. Yeah. It's but, a pretty, it's a pretty big deal, but I, I, I want to see what it's, what the, what another franchise is like, you know. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, they're, they're always a good time. They, they, I think baseball does really well at putting together family affairs. Um, but uh, something you mentioned earlier too. Again, this is before we went on the air. Uh, I see that you got Leo Cardenas behind you uh, in uh, bobblehead, and uh, so. You were telling a very interesting story about this uh, this legendary Reds player here, and yeah. So every year when I go to the Reds Fest, I always love stopping and seeing Leo. Leo Cardenas, uh, Cuban player. He's one of the last Cuban baseball players to get out of Cuba during the whole after the whole revolution, and Fidel wind up putting a close down on Cubans leaving. He was one of the last Cuban ball players to get out of that country, and he played for what at the time was Cincinnati's Triple A team. Today, our Triple A team is the Louisville Bats down in Louisville, Kentucky. That's Louisville, not Louisville, Louisville. Uh, and they, the, it was the Havana Sugar Kings, and I, you can actually get Havana Sugar Kings gear from Ebbets Field flannels, T-shirts, jackets, mm -hmm. all types of stuff. So the the Havana Sugar Kings was the Triple A team for the Cincinnati Reds, and he was one of the last to get out. And interesting little factoid about this guy was that he was actually injured by a bullet. Uh, one of the games that he was uh, playing in, 
Uh, he, the Cuban Fidel's guys, all of his soldiers were in the stands watching the game. And after they, the sugar Kings won, they started shooting in the air and one of the bullets grazed him, didn't injure him, but it did graze him. And that's something that, uh, you know, he'll always remember. And what's also interesting about Leo is the city that he was born in, in Cuba. Um, the name is escaping me right now is where the first, they believe the first organized baseball game was played in Cuba. By, Amer by American soldiers. Um, so it's pretty neat. Yeah, it's pretty neat. And he's an old man. He's he's really old. He had a, a, a solid, good career. He's in the Reds Hall of Fame. Um, he had a really good career. He made a few other stops. The Twins, he spent some time with the Minnesota Twins. But just a, a great old timer who's at Reds Fest every year and is just a joy to talk to. You know, it's, it, it, it's really interesting because, like, you know, these – these first exiled players, you know, that came over from that came over from Cuba when it was, I mean, really dang. Not that, not that uh, Yasiel Puig and UNS Cespedes have didn't go through trials and tribulations of their own. I'm certainly not making light of that. But I mean, these last few players that you know, these players that were, able, were getting out when it was the most heated, most yeah. treacherous. Yeah. And I mean, they're they're getting up there, and um, and you know, it's you know. You know, we've talked we've talked uh, exhaustively about uh, Louis Tiant and uh, his uh, his inexplainable um, not being in the Hall of Fame, but that's yeah, that's, that's 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 <laughs> that's an exhausted topic that we've touched on quite a bit. But um, you know, those guys are getting on up there in age, and it's it it's a story that you know we're we're never going to see again in our lifetime. You know, I. I I don't really, I really don't foresee relations with Cuba going back to the way that they were that yeah. intensely. I mean, I could be wrong and, and, and hopefully not, but, um, you know, all, all roads are leading to a little bit more of a easier path for people to come over from there and particularly in, in specifics of baseball to come over and play major league baseball and everything a little bit easier than that. And so it's, it's an interesting story that, that you get to hear firsthand from a guy who actually experienced it. And that's, uh, and, and talking to him amongst other guys as well is that uh, they thought, eh, maybe a couple of years, we'll be back, you know? Right. And here we are in 2018. Um, I mean, literally, you're talking early 60s where these guys thought, okay, there's a lot of political drama going on. I got to move to the States. What, two or three years? I'll be flying back to Havana for, you know, off season. A lot of these guys thought, ah, this is a little hiccup in the road. You know what I yeah. mean? But fast forward, now we're in 2018, and Leo hasn't been back. And I think uh, Tian has only been back once or twice. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, so it's pretty, it's, uh, you know, if, if you're into politics, if you're into baseball, Cuba has always a lot of interesting stories, you know, with that. I just read the biography of, um, of uh, 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 Tony Perez. And, oh yeah, yeah. And his biographer went down to Cuba and wanted to do some research on where he was born. He started asking around. Nobody knew who Tony Perez was. The guy's in the in, the, in Cooperstown, a Hall of Fame career, uh, just a legendary baseball player. And and this and he was basically telling the story that nine out of ten people he asked who were in baseball in Cuba, old timers had no idea who Tony Perez was and he was born in Cuba. That's but it just, insane. Yeah. It just kind of goes to show you that, you know, there was during his time during the sixties and early seventies, there was a complete blockade. There was no information going back and forth. So Jeez. one of their own, one of their own was, um, you know, is, is not even really known to them, you know? Yeah. Unbelievable stories. And you know, that might be an interesting, uh, interesting topic to, to touch on in another one, like get a little bit more in depth on, but, uh, something we wanted to discuss tonight uh, by bringing you on was we actually we we're going to talk about cigars. So for, the, for oh, yeah. This, oh yeah, this uh, is a cigar yeah. show. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Crown Heads has had a you know you you were on take 21, and even in the short months that have gone between takes, you know there's been a lot that's been going on with Crown Heads, in particular the last 18 months in general, but you know specifically the you know the last few months there's been a lot of great cigars that have been released. You know your annual Las Cal Calaveras. Uh, was released, um, you know, in the spring as well. Uh, the Bellicosa Finos, the La Carême Bellicosa Finos uh, limited edition, the Luminosa 
uh, big gauge six by sixty. Uh, the first six by sixty, if I'm not mistaken, the first That's six, correct. Correct. six by sixty out of uh, crown heads. Uh, either factory that you guys have partnered with in the past. But on that subject of uh, of factories, this project that I'm holding right here in my hand that I've already snapped the label on is the first uh, first um, cigar that you guys have broken from that two factory relationship and gone to a third factory now. Mm -hmm. And that would be Drew Estate. And this is, of course, the Buckeye Land. Uh, which I have not smoked, and I am about to light this up, and and uh, I'm excited to to uh, to go ahead and partake with this. But this is the fourth state exclusive cigar. Of course, uh, I'm privileged to live in Texas, so therefore I, I get the second state exclusive you guys did, which is the Yellow Rose. Yep. Um, the yellow, uh, the Tennessee Waltz, which the Yellow Rose and the Tennessee Waltz, while different vitolas, do share the common uh, the common right. denominator of the uh, Connecticut broadleaf wrapper. Mm -hmm. um, the Yellow Rose, of course, is a box press torpedo. Uh, the uh, Tennessee Waltz is a tr traditional Parejo. Uh, do you guys is that a Corona Gorda? Is that what you guys call it? No, it's 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 like a cross between a Robusto and a Toro. Really. Okay, um, it, it's really uh, the Tennessee Waltz is more uh, uh, almost a Toro esque or Robusto esque, if you will. Um, and it is a Parejo, and then. Uh, that is, you know, has the orange foot band, uh, obviously orange, um, people think of Tennessee and, and so, uh, and then yellow Rosa, Texas box press torpedo. It's the same blend, uh, both made by Pepe and Garcia, both 20 count boxes. Uh, those are those, those two States, uh, represent a lot to us because Tennessee being our, our home state and Tennessee being, you know, one of our biggest supporters across the board when it comes to accounts, when it comes to sales, when it comes to attendance at events, um, really incredible. And, you know, our rep Wes Thornton, who lives in Tennessee, obviously he's there to represent Tennessee Waltz and Brian McGee, who, you know, very well is in Texas. And, and, and so those two, uh, mean a lot to us. They have a lot of history with us and those are our number one selling SKUs in each and each one of those States. And then there's the Hawaii, the Paniolo, which we were talking about before we went on air. The Paniolo is interesting because although it is a state exclusive to the state of Hawaii, it really is not available to all retailers in Hawaii, as the Yellow Rose and Tennessee Waltz are. Those are available to all retailers in those states. As long as you're an authorized Crown Heads retailer, you can get those cigars. In Hawaii, the Paniolo is only available through our field wine. Uh, which is a huge supporter of us. And every January, February, we launch a new Paniolo. And what makes Paniolo different is also every year the blend changes. Uh, Pepin has done it a few times. Ernesto's done it a few times. And then pretty soon we'll announce 2019 and we'll announce who's doing 2019 as well. Um, after that, we took a little time off. And when I came on board with Crown Heads, Ohio, which is my home state, Ohio is shot up to be one of our top five best states in the country. Uh, it is just it has turned into one of our biggest supporters. So a, a way to say thank you to Ohio was to give them a state exclusive. And hence Buckeye Land uh, comes forth this year. There were a few hiccups. We wanted to get it out earlier in the year, but it came out later in the year. But nevertheless, it has proven to be a huge success and it's been an incredible, incredible ride so far on that cigar. Yeah. Um, from the light right now, just really get a nice, uh, we're going to talk about another one of y'all's recent releases with, uh, the same rapper. This is a San Andreas, uh, Mexican rapper that you guys had. So, um, same thing with this year's Los Calaveras, also another San Andreas rap cigar. Uh, but this cigar tastes, has a beautiful, uh, San Andreas taste to it. Um, you know, that chocolatey, leather coffee right off the get now i'm getting some interesting notes from the from also little there's a little meatiness to it and there's just there's a little bit of rate um i'm getting kind of a hold on there's a sweet note i'm trying to pick it up uh like other than the chocolate so what i get is in it i get raisins yeah, I get I get a dried raisiny um, raisins are dry, but dried raisiny kind of a sweetness to it where it's not overly sweet, but it can kind of get you in the back there. 
And that's that's one of the sweetnesses that I pick up on that cigar. Yeah, I was gonna say raisin. Um, there, the so I I try. There's some there's some things about some Maduro cigars or some darker wrap cigars sometimes. Uh, and I've had this discussion with Coop that sometimes um, in the at least in the initial part, I get a lot of dried fruit. You know, and that varies from you know dried cherry, yeah. cranberry, raisin, and sometimes it's. Um, it dissipates pretty quickly sometimes. So I, I usually, I usually, you know, smoke the cigar a little further before I kind of like determine like, Oh, that's yeah. Raisin, you know, raisins, a consistent quality throughout it. Um, but I'm, I'm enjoying this, man. This is uh from the, from the first initial light. That's it. It, it gets your attention. And it's, this is kind of a, so far it's kind of a medium bodied a little bit, uh, definitely full flavored. I mean, you get a lot of, you get a lot of, a lot of pop out of it for sure. So the idea is it being is a medium bodied cigar, but with some full, full flavors on your palate, you're going to get cedar, you're going to get mahogany, you're going to get that little bit of uh, sweetness that you're going to get from uh, from the raisin. Now, if you retrohale it, you will pick up a pepper that is not noticeable, very noticeable at all when you're just smoking it on your on your tongue. I was going to say you get very little black pepper, very little any spice. But when you retrohale it, you get a lot of black pepper. And so uh, I was discussing with one of my accounts that I that I deal with. He was saying it, it's very interesting because he felt like it tasted like two different cigars when he smoked it, and then when he decided to retrohale it, it to him be, it were like two completely different blends. So if you decide to retrohale it, you will definitely pick up some black pepper um, that you do not get on the natural on the on the regular smoking of the on your palate. Yeah, I was actually going to say like the the the. The smoke itself, just smoking it like firsthand, as you said, it not very peppery at all, but you get a beautiful spice that really complements it. And as my general manager at Michael's Tobacco, Tracy Spence often says, if you're not retrohaling, it's almost like you're you're not smoking half the cigar. Mm -hmm. So uh, to get that really great full experience from this particular and um, man, I I gotta say that I'd be able if I had smoked this blind, I would have been able to pick up. Uh, not necessarily, obviously, having never smoked, it, I wouldn't have been able to tell it was a Buckeye Land, but it would have been able to tell that it was a Drew Estate cigar because look at that that constant billowing of smoke. I'm always impressed. It's it's a characteristic of Drew Estate cigars. And there's other manufacturers that put out cigars that do the same thing, but it's a defining characteristic of nearly all Drew Estate cigars. Nico Rusticas, Liga 9s, T52s, um, you name it, that that undercrowns that continuing billowed smoke as the cigar's just resting. And I just think it's one. Of, it, absolutely, it absolutely does nothing for the flavor of the cigar, but it, I just think it's one of the coolest effects uh, you know, of something we, they manufacture. You know, look, we've all been we've been a huge fan of Willie Herrera. Um, you know, before he even joined uh, Drew State, and Willie and, and John Huber have been friends for years. And you know, they've always said, "Oh, we should work together. We got to do something." And with this project, there's a it's a long story, but eventually this project we were looking for a home uh and unexpectedly we were looking for a home for this cigar from where we started and willie said you know let me take a shot at it and and uh john and willie willie uh, gets a hundred percent uh credit for blending the cigar and making the cigar and doing everything he that that you know to make it what it is today um john really came up with the marketing that everything behind it and john said this is what i want this is what i'm looking for uh those two guys came together and, and as we say formed like voltron and and created this incredible incredible cigar now the my my little um besides suggesting ohio i got to choose the size and six inch by 48 ring gauge is something that I, I I'm a big Corona Gorda fan, so that's five five eighths by forty six. That's a true Cuban sized Corona Gorda, and we do a lot of those at, at Crown Heads. And so I thought about doing a, a Corona Gorda, but I wanted to do it just a little bit bigger ring gauge. So we went with the forty eight, and we went with the six. What's interesting is is the Cuban Churchill is a seven by forty seven. So Correct. this is an inch shorter. And just a tad bit ring gauge bigger from a 47 to 48. So I don't know if there's a real name for a 6x48. I don't think there is a, an official Fabrica name from Cuba for that size. I don't think there's a, a real 
I don't know what you'd call it, a short Churchill? What could you call that size? I mean, it, that's something that I don't think you really have a name for it. You know what I mean? Because with when you have um, the Tennessee Waltz, which is a five and a half by 52, all right, that's a Toro. All right, you can call that a Toro. Yellow Rose is six and one fourth by 54. So that's a, a Bellicose. It's a torpedo, box press torpedo. But, you know, it's a it's a torpedo of the size of a, of a nice large Toro. Sure. But this is a six by forty eight, and the the Corona Gorda size is what we do for Paniolo every year. So they like the smaller cigars out in Hawaii, which is really great. But six by forty eight is something that I fell in love with, and we've got a lot of compliments on not going with a big ring gauge and, and sticking with something more traditional. And I think Willie and John knocked it out the box, and um, I think that's why a lot of cigar guys like yourself, cigar heads. Um, cigar fans, geeks, nerds, whatever we call ourselves, are a huge fan right now of Buckeye Land, and I think it turned out it turned out incredible. So we're very proud of it. Um, you know, as you should be. I think that. Um, well, first of all, I mean, if you know, Willie Herrera certainly doesn't you know need any introduction when he goes when he goes into a room with cigar people in it. Um, and uh, and he's and he's certainly noticeable, not just because of you know he's about twenty feet tall, and everything, but just the uh, his credentials that he's brought to the table at oh. Drew Estate even before that. And then it was really exciting. Like I said, th- like I said, you were you were you were kind of asking me like, what were were people excited about Willie being partnered with it? And uh, you know, you know, and I was saying that there were some people that knew and some people that didn't know. They just enjoyed the cigar. And I think, but once they found out, like that took it to like a whole other level of like, oh my God, he's working with Crown Heads now. I had no idea for people who didn't know. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was really exciting for a lot of folks um, because he just, he, you know, he has, he brandishes that reputation from, from the perspective of working with different companies on these special blends and, you know, other blends across the court, the Crown Heads portfolio and everything. Is it, um, you know, what, what are some challenges from, from, from your perspective in the business um as far as being able to communicate and work with th- now okay it's one cigar but now three separate factories yeah. uh, to 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 facilitate the business need well it, it's very interesting and without getting too in, in too in depth behind the scenes everybody is so different working with the garcias at the my father cigar factory they have their way of blending cigars they have their way of making cigars they have their way of communicating working with Ernesto Perez Carrillo, who we call El Padrino, the godfather. Um, It's a very unique way of working with Ernie. Ernie has his way of communicating. He has his way of making cigars. And and then with Drew Estate, you know, Swedish Match, uh, or uh, um, a Swedish Match. Swisher. uh, Swisher, who owns them, you know, they have their way of doing things. And and Er uh, Willie has his way. And so there's these three companies, and they each are very unique within their own. Cigars, look, the, the making and rolling of blending of cigars have not changed much over the last 150, 200 years, right? But the factories can be very, very, very different. And I think when you look at all of our core lines, how different each blend is and how each blend is different and how each brand is different, uh, working with everybody is very different. And, and Willie and John go back to more of a friendship. They've known each other. They they you know shoot the shit together they hang out at the trade show uh so it's like you know two guys that have that are friends working together on something the garcias who are a legend already in this industry and you know we're one of their clients uh you know they make some cigars for ashton they make cigars for tatuaje latelier amongst others um and they have a very unique uh style but Ernie, on the other hand, Ernie is more like a, almost a family member. You know what I mean? I always, sure. I try to describe when people ask me about our relationship with Ernie, I always say if John and Mike are the owners of Crown Heads, uh, Ernie's like the silent third brother. You know what I mean? He he is so involved in our day-to-day creating product and cigars, and he truly has our best interest at hand, and, and he is just a wonderful and incredible person. Um, and, and so Ernie has a little special place in our hearts. Um, and that's why we take projects to him like CHC Reserve. And we take projects like the Ciudad de Musica Monte Cristo that we did for Altidus. And that's why we take a lot of those projects too. Now that was one I didn't even mention before the air, the Ciudad yeah. de Musica. Oh my God. Yeah. That, what an iconic 
It's yeah, hard yeah, for you guys which, to do. Which is an incredible opportunity for us to such an icon, iconic brand. Um, you know, it'd be like someone coming to you and asking you to sing one of um, Frank Sinatra's songs, you know what I mean? On, <laughs> on, on, a, on an album dedicated to him or something, you know? So um, it's incredible, you know? And, and so working with her, Willie, it's a different, completely different world, you know, because Willie is uh, a friend of John's. And to kind of work together like that, two guys who have been in the industry who truly love tobacco, love cigars, Willie obviously more on the blending side and John more on the creative side. To me, it's just a, it's a match made in heaven. And uh, I, I'm very lucky that I get to represent um, Crown Heads. I get to represent those blends and I'm looking forward to that relationship. You know, I tell everyone, I don't, I'm not privy to exactly what's going on in the future on everything, but I will tell you that um, we're, we're, we're not going to stop at, at Buckeye land. There's going to be more to come with uh, John and Willie. That's uh, well, that's wonderful to hear. So you had said you were, you mentioned this early on and it was just, it kind of, it kind of stuck out to me. You, you said that you guys were looking for a home for the cigar and that's what led you eventually to the relationship with Drew Estate. What was it? Were Ernie or the Garcias were they having trouble procuring the tobacco that you guys were wanting to use, or was it a, a you know was it the size? We mentioned the unique size characteristic that was it was a problem. What what was uh, some of the challenges as far as finding the home for the cigar? Other, well, I mean, yeah, I think it's like anything else. I think that you can work on a project with um, with different factories. You can work on 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 different projects, and not not everything will always. You don't always get to that final product that you want that you that you feel like is what you're hitting at, right? And I think I think when we decided to look back internally and say, okay, let's let's kind of restart us over. Let's kind of look at what we can do. Um, um, I always think it's it's amazing to me. All things happen really for a reason. That we were working on this project, it really wasn't going the route that we wanted to. Um, John said, okay, let's kind of refocus. Let's kind of take a, a step back and really look at this project. And then Drew Estate comes in, Willie comes in, and it just, it turned out to be just a, a, a great, just a, a great combination. And, and at the end of the day, we have a product that we all couldn't be more prouder about, you know what I mean? And so uh, it's, it's incredible. You know, we look at, you know, we, we, we always toy around with multiple factories, you know what I mean? There's factories that approach us every year um, to work together on projects and you, you start certain projects with them and maybe they don't end up where you want them to be. And you say, okay, maybe in the future, there's something for us to do in the future, but not, not this project's not going right. So where that project started and where it ended uh, was two different places. But at the end of the day, it turned out, it turned out amazing. So we're very proud. Really, really quick. And I hate to put you on the spot, Miguel, if you don't know, I do apologize. What's the number one skew on in crown heads of portfolio? Four kicks. Four kicks. So that's that's a, that's an Ernesto Perez Carrillo cigar. That is Ernesto uh, Perez Carrillo. That is uh, our number our number one selling blend, and it was our first cigar that we ever released, right. and that's, it has maintained all these years being our number one selling brand. So multiple SKUs as being our best sellers. Guy, if you'd given me three guesses, I would have screwed that up so bad. Um, yeah. I, I really would. have. I mean, I lo don't know. I get this is what I look, look. I get I get all the time when guys go. Let me guess what your best sellers are. And they'll rattle off different brands and they always leave out four kicks. And at the end of the day, as a national sales manager, I get to look at the numbers, right? Four kicks by far is our, is our, is our top selling line. And um, in a way it shows you the timelessness of that blend and that brand and the staying power of what that, feel of that brand the name four kicks the sizes the victolas the blend the feel behind it um it the just consistency continues. by the you consist know by ernie yeah absolutely the absolutely absolutely so it, we've we you and i've and and many others we've often lamented how how truly wonderful this industry is with you know like it is you know people are competition but they're not competition yeah there's a couple sour apples out there but for the most part a a lot of people collectively get along. There's a couple bitter rivalries here and there, I guess you could say, but for the most part, there's a big collection of, you know, people, you know, that there it's a, it's a huge Venn diagram, the cigar industry. And, uh, but I mean, is there any, uh, 
I mean, is there any kind of bragging right that, you know, that Ernie's got the number one cigar for you guys when you guys work now with three other, two other factories? He's like, Hey, I, I still, I still got it. I still got the number one uh, cigar for you for this, uh, for the crowned heads. Well, I think, I think Ernie knows and Ernie, uh, is, as I said before, Ernie takes such an invested, um, feel to our company that we literally call him El Padrino, the Godfather, because he's literally the Godfather of our company. If we get a great rating, it makes him exciting. If we get a bad rating, it hurts. It breaks his heart. If it, whatever it is, Ernie is like ride or die with us, man. I mean, and and I'm taking our sales team down in January, January to his factory, which is called Tabacalera La Alianza, TLA for short. And people actually can fo follow them on on Instagram. They have their own Instagram. Besides Ernie having his and and uh, EPC cigars having their factory has uh, a, a, an Instagram as well. Um, TLA uh, Tobacco Little La Alianza and that factory is just there, there's so much love. There's so much so much special about that factory that. Um, taking my sales team down look there's a lot of places we could take them but they have to go to ernie they have to see tla because tla is where four kicks where crown heads where john and mike launched this brand and there's so much so much to it you know oh absolutely i think you know i, I you know i think anyone that, is, that knows anything about your company and the relationships involved with again with all due respect to everybody involved that's you know that's that's the place they was born you know, yeah. I mean, if, for, for what, you know, for wherever this goes and, you know, you, you guys might end up pairing with dozens of factories, but when it's all said and done, you know, that's, that's where it's all going to have started. And so it's, it's right to, it's right, you know, as a history guy myself, uh, you know, it's right to pay homage to the, to the, to the, the place where things were born and, and everything like that. So that's, that's fantastic. What a great experience for, for your team that that's going to be, um, Speaking of speaking of that factory in particular, I, I said that we were going to talk about this. So I recently had, um, so Coop and I have this segment on primetime special edition uh, where we've done this now. This is our second rendition of it. We don't, we're, uh, I'm a huge age experimentation guy with cigars. I will, if I like a cigar or even if I don't like a cigar, if, uh, you know, there's something int that intrigues me about it for particular, I'll do different aging experiments. I've got freaking disgustingly huge spreadsheet of all my cigars that I have in my, my personal inventory. And when I plan on smoking them, I space them out just because I want to. Wow. And that's because I'm a nerd. That's a whole other level, man. Yeah, wow. Just because I'm a nerd and I'm, and I'm stupid and I have apparently way too much time on ha my hands, even though I have no time on my hands, but I make time for this apparently. Um, and so Cooper was really, you know, cause I would, when we were just doing topical discussions on the show, I would smoke cigars that I had been aging for, you know, variant amount of times different cigars in general you know you we usually smoke like tonight i usually smoke the cigar of that's associated with my guest and uh but for the most part when we just have topical shows i'll, I'll smoke you know some of my from my age collection for uh various reasons and same, things like that so uh that kicked off the segment idea the first one we did was we smoked one right away and then we smoked one six months later was the total sustias from steve saka uh, Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. And now we're doing a, th a second experiment and we're doing three cigars. We smoked one six months ago. Well, actually it was seven months. We were going to space it out to six months and then a year. And that was the La Carême um, from Crowned Heads. And uh, I did the Robusto. Uh, he has a different Vitola, but I did the Robusto. They're all out of the same box um, and uh, all on the same order. So like as close together as we could, we, diff we did different Vitolas uh, on this time just just to vary it up just a little bit. Um, and, you know, we smoked, you know, it seven months ago, and then we just smoked it a, a, about a week or so ago. Um, Miguel, I've told everybody I can get, like they can get with an earshot on that. That is the best crown head cigar I have ever smoked. A six month old La Carême Robusto is the best cigar from you guys I have ever smoked. Either factory, any blend, any brand, and I and it's it's not even my favorite brand that you guys yeah. make. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. And well, Ernesto, Ernesto Perez Carrillo makes that one as well. And you know the the interesting about that cigar, it's named after a French chef, uh, Marie La Carême, 
And it is it is a cigar that supports that Connecticut broadleaf Maduro wrapper. It's our only cigar regular line that doesn't use a Nicaraguan binder. It uses an Ecuador um, binder on it, Nicaraguan filler. And truly, I think right out of the box, you get a very chocolatey, um, sweet component to the cigar. Uh, when you age that cigar, as silly as it sounds, it almost becomes chocolate milk-like. It becomes as very creamy, more creamy, chocolatey. Yeah. And that cigar doesn't have a lot of strength. It, it's not a very strong cigar, but whatever little strength is there in six months, it kind of mellows out a little bit and you get this just very creamy uh, flavor. Now, I prefer the Hermoso and then I smoke the Robusto. That's second. the that's the Vitola that Coop does, yeah. I love the Hermoso. It's kind of a, a box press Churchill that cigar, I find myself selling a lot of boxes at events. People really like that cigar. And what I notice about that cigar is a lot of guys that I see that maybe glance over at first, I'll, I'll go back to it and I'll say, now remember, it's a dark cigar, but it doesn't mean it's strong. It's got a very creamy texture. So guys that like full-bodied cigars, they, they'll play in the medium. They'll play in the full-bodied range, right? What I've noticed is that guys who smoke mild cigars, who would usually buy Luminosa from us or even Four Kicks from us, um, which is a smooth, medium-bodied cigar, that once you kind of tell them about La Carême, they're all about La Carême because the strength isn't going to overwhelm you. They want to smoke Maduros. They want to smoke dark cigars like their friends who maybe smoke stronger cigars. But La Carême is a cigar that I think kind of goes across the board mild guys medium guys full-bodied cigars it, it just has a great flavor and it just the only way I, I don't think you like that cigar is if you don't like box press cigars um that is that is a blend that is our i would tell you this we were talking about our best-selling line four kicks uh la creme is our fastest growing line in our lineup just really decadent it's decadent before it's decadent right out of the box as you said but the the spot this this there's some more spiciness to it, but yeah, absolutely the body the intensity does go down a bit for me. There's an interesting note in it, I, and I want to I wanted to ask you this because I wanted to see if you picked it up. And Coop, I don't know, it was either through power suggestion. He also said that he was kind of picking it up too. I get and it, I get a very distinct to me because I've I've played around with the herb a lot. Um, Thai basil. I get a sweet mm. Thai basil note right in the middle of that cigar. Almost every time I smoke it, almost every Vitola, I get it a lot more on the Robusto. Um, and it really, it, it really goes well with the flavor components. It really, really balances with the blend incredibly well. Um, have you ever gotten that before? Have you heard anybody? No, I, I, I can't say um, Thai basil. I don't know. Obviously, I'm very familiar with basil. In fact, I, I grew basil in my in my herb garden for years. It was just regular, everyday kind of basil. But I do have Thai basil at some Thai restaurants. They're very proud to say we use Thai basil. So, but I would say that 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 flavor has never hit my palate that I that I know of. But tomorrow, I'm uh, tomorrow morning about three a.m. in the morning. I'm flying to Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, the first cigar I will smoke when I get to the office will be a La Carême, and I will be looking for that. What I what I find exciting about talking cigars with other people is finding out what flavors they pick up, what kind of things they pick up. Mm -hmm. um, I was smoking another brand cigar, and there was a flavor that I just could not, I just could not place this flavor. And uh, and as I'm smoking with a couple of other guys, someone said, man, it has a very citrusy kind of tone to it. And that's exactly I just couldn't put the flavor with the word. And so uh, I love talking cigars with guys because I, I think that's part of the fun. Right. I think that's true. Sure. If, if there's one thing is to smoke a cigar. Like when I'm doing a cigar event, I'm smoking, talking, but I enjoy the aroma. But there's another when I get to really sit back and smoke a cigar and really think about the cigar, um, think about the construction. And and uh, and that's what I like to do when, when people tell me those things. I love to go back and, and try cigars and, and see if I can pick up those flavors. 
Yeah, I think that's that's one of my my favorite things to do. And 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 you know, I've got a lot. I'm lucky that I've had a lot of friends of mine who have started smoking cigars with me, who like do it, who have kind of I, I've kind of influenced them. They 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 like enjoying that. And uh, even though they 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 feel sometimes they feel you know somewhat silly or inferior a little bit because they're like, oh man, I just don't have the palate that you do. I'm like, man, just shut up and tell me what you taste. Tell, you know, I I don't care. Like we're not here to yeah. rank rank you know our palates or anything like that it's just a it's a really enjoyable conversation i totally agree with you there but yeah uh, and i think guys like you were saying your friends who make oh i don't have that palate i think a lot of people have those palates but i don't think they have tried to utilize their palates you know drink a glass of wine and instead of just drinking it try to pick it apart even when you have dinner like mm -hmm. there are there are times uh i'll i'll, I'll use um Guacamole. Let's use guacamole for an example. Guacamole is just guacamole to someone. They eat it. They like it. Yeah. But when you eat guacamole, you should be able to pick out the onion. You should be able to pick out the cilantro. You should pick out the lime, the salt, the garlic. All those flavors are in there that make this make this final product that we call guacamole, right? And you can eat it and you can just, you know, eat it and don't even think about it. But when you eat something like that, Try to eat it and pick the different pieces apart. And that's mm -hmm. how you hone your palate. And that's where you look at any of these guys that are super tasters or are very famous for their wine uh, tasting or even or even food uh, food writers. Um, that's how they do it. They'll they'll eat something and say, all right, let me pick this apart and let me let me hone my skills. And I tell guys, look, we all smoke cigars sometimes just to go through the motion, right? Sometimes right. when you're doing stuff, like when I'm grilling, sometimes I'm just smoking a cigar and I'm like so concentrated on the food on the grill. But then sometimes we want to smoke a cigar and we actually want to concentrate on the cigar. And that's exactly that's, that's how you train yourself. But it just takes time and, and it's fun. Really, it's fun. It absolutely is, man. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the process. I think it's it's one of those things that's that's fantastic and, and just enjoyable. It's fun. It's it's Cigar smoking is one of those things that's, that it really is enhanced by the community, the community and the company around you. Uh, it's not just the tremendous, uh, you know, a good cigar Absolutely. can become a great cigar if the discussion um, is, is is fantastic. And and 100%. that's why that's why like you know, and and I'm and I'm doing some reviews for Cigar Dojo now, and you know, even as I'm reviewing cigars, um, I you know I I still I still tell myself that you know if I'm not enjoying a particular cigar as much as as other ones that I've smoked, you know, at this, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it, the community that this, that this industry creates is, is just absolutely uh, one of a kind. And it makes for just, uh, just tremendous, tremendous, tremendous people to come to the forefront. And it's, it, it creates bonds, man. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I, I tell people this story all the time. The first time you and I met was, was on take 21. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we started talking before the show, we, we hit it off on a certain couple of common subjects that you and I both enjoy baseball being one, but pr us presidents was another. Yeah. Big um, time. And, and, um, and it was, it all started, it all started with this, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. it all started with the cigar Absolutely. and, uh, and that's where, you know, lifelong friendships can start, man, is, is with, with sitting down and enjoying one of these, um, you know, with your fellow, you know, your fellow man or fellow woman and, and, and really really enjoying the the fruits of the labor of of the great people like Ernesto Perez Carrillo, Don Pepin Garcia, Willie Herrera. Um, you know, their their effort is uh, you know, notwithstanding, you know, is only enhanced by by that kind of experience for sure. But uh, just to just to trans transfer over a little bit, just to complete the circle a little bit, we talked about a couple of the limited editions that you guys have done this past year. But also the other big cigar at IPCPR trade show this year that you guys announced, um, which was actually prior to the announcement of Buck Island, was um, what the hat that you're wearing, which is the uh, the Crown Heads uh, Court Reserve. Yeah. Um, now the official name is the Court Reserve Seventeenth. Uh, is that it? Eighteenth. Eighteenth. <laughs> CHC. It's CHC Reserve Eighteen, which stands for Crown Heads Court uh, Reserve Twenty Eighteen. Really. Um, and it was a cigar, uh, you know, how you talk about, uh, Ernie and what he means to us. This was a cigar that we created for the crown heads fans, for the crown heads supporters, for the crown heads fanatics. 
which we refer to as our court, or they refer to themselves as our court. And so we, we picked up that name. And we love these guys and these gals. They're huge supporters of what we do. Um, John Huber is very accessible through social media. You know, John doesn't do a lot of events. Um, John Huber is a family man. Um, this guy has a, a wonderful son. He has a beautiful daughter, a beautiful wife, and, and he loves this industry, and he gives 100% to this industry. But he's a family man, so he's he, he doesn't get on the road very often, and, and we respect that very much. But he's very accessible through social media. And uh, the amount of people that reach out to him on a daily basis who love crown heads really strikes a chord with John and Mike. Um, it means a lot to those guys. You know, they've been in the industry combined 60 plus years. They have been in this industry combined. And um, so when we were looking at creating a, a special cigar, Crown Heads Court is not a regular production. It's not a limitada like our traditional limitadas. We rolled 150,000 sticks and we're going to release them a little as we go along here. Um, it'll probably last us until spring of, of, of 2019. It's a biannual release, so the next release you'll see is 2020. Right now, the plan is to go to different manufacturers to make our Crown Heads Court. Kind of uh, like so the Paniolo, have, Paniolo? Yeah, very similar like Paniolo. We'll, we'll pick a different uh, factory. But when we were working on the first one, what do you do? You go back to where it all started. Right. Tobacco Letta La Alianza, Ernesto Perez Carrillo. And so the actual three sizes are a 5x50 Robusto, a 6x54 Toro, and then a 5.58x46 Corona Gorda. Why those three sizes? Those were the first three sizes that we put out in Four Kicks when Four Kicks was launched. Oh, man. Yeah, That's so we awesome. chose the first three Vitolas that Crown Heads ever released. We chose to release in the Crown Heads court. So those three sizes uh, are not about market research. It's about going back to the roots of the company. It's about saying the Robusto, the Sublime, and the Corona Gorda is what put Crown Heads on the map. And so we went back to Ernie and said, Ernie, can you do this project for us? And we had never made a Mexican San Andreas for us before. So this was his um, his his opportunity to work with Mexican San Andreas for a Crown Heads project. And in my opinion, and, and look, we make a lot of cigars, man. We make a lot of cigars. So I, I smoke everything all day. Not only do I smoke all of our core line and our limited edition, but I'm also smoking stuff that John is constantly sending me to sample new projects he's working on. So I'm smoking all types of stuff. You know what I mean? Our TAA, all types of stuff that we're working on. God, the Angel's Anvil this year. Oh, my gosh, man. Thanks. I only smoked one of them. Yeah, guys very good. Yeah, on very, it. very elegant cigar this year. Yeah. But oh, that's a great word to describe it. Absolutely. Very elegant blend this year. I found myself smoking the Crown Heads Court Corona Gorda con constantly from us working on the blend to us having it at the trade show to us finally getting it out to the, to the, to the retailers to ultimately to the consumers. I smoke a lot of Four Kicks. I smoke a lot of Jericho Hill. And I even had some of my hardcore guys, my big supporters, you know, guys that know me in the industry going, bro, where's your Jericho Hill? Where's your four kicks? All you got is a CHC Corona Gorda in your hand. I love that Corona Gorda. I'm very proud of how CHC turned out. Uh, it's got a, a lot of nice age on it. It's been sitting in, the, you know, sitting in the aging room for a while. So we're very proud to get it out. And um, there's, a, there's a whole circle of life to that cigar and so i think john knocked it out the box with ernie and did a hell of a job man hell of a job yeah i've already uh speaking of my age experimentation from earlier in the show i've already got uh i've got three uh the corona gordas uh, nice. already uh parceled out i've i'm one i'm doing one i'm going i'm going i'm going downtown with this one man i'm going i'm going hardcore on this one i'm going a year and a half Ooh. uh Three years, and I'm I'm doing one at at, uh, at seven years. That's um, commitment. That I is. Wanna, I want to see what this cigar does with long long term, because I had heard it'd been aging for a while in general. So I wanted to yep. see what an exorbitant amount of aging would do to this particular cigar. So I've already paced it out. So a year and a half, three years, 
and seven years. Uh, and the only reason I didn't go to six is because I hate the number six. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. I like actually. I like all numbers divisible by seven. So I don't know. I think it's a. I think it's a, a religious thing. I have no idea. But the interesting thing about Crown Hits Court when I when I am put on the spot and someone says, "All right, tell me what kind of cigar it is," I tell everybody that it is a medium bodied cigar with all of the flavors that you get from a full bodied cigar. So you get the hardwood, the mahoganies, the full robust, thick, heavy, chewy smoke that you get from like a La Imperiosa or another full bodied cigar, a cigar that's really going to hit you. But you get those flavors in a medium bodied cigar. So anybody who knows me knows that La Imperiosa sells fantastic for us. It's a wonderful cigar that Pepin Garcia makes for us. It's the original uh 2014 Las, Las Calaveras basically different Vitolas but, though because it's different not Vitolas, yep different Vitolas but that cigar I smoke that is a very strong cigar for my palate and so I like I I enjoy medium bodied cigars and also I love Connecticut's as well but I love the flavors of a full bodied cigar but sometimes full bodied cigars can can really lay me out man because I smoke seven eight cigars a day every day so that Crown Heads Court for me gives me all the flavors that I get from a full-bodied cigar, but I get it in a medium-bodied cigar. And that's what I think is special and unique about the CHC Reserve. It's like smoking a full-bodied cigar without the head rush, without the full body, you know, the booming uh, full bodiness that you get from a strong cigar, and that, that's what I like about CHC. That's very, that's very uh, depth description of it, Miguel. I totally agree with you there because that was something that you and I talked about before the show was that it, it is a unique use of the San Andreas wrapper. When I lit that cigar up, it did not taste, it did not have those those quintessential, stereotypical, general San Andreas wrap cigar flavors to me. It is very rustic. You know, mm -hmm. you get a lot, there's a lot of those deep, woody flavors to it. Um, but the the intensity is lacking, and that's that's not a negative. Uh, that's not a negative drawback. It's just incredibly unique. So, it and that kind of leads me to this. This kind of this is my kind of my last question before we wrap up here. Was there any concern uh, about this year? It, it, it obviously has gone incredibly well for you guys. So it's it certainly hasn't been a drawback at all. But was there any concern about this year? with releasing, you know, you guys already have the Jericho Hill, which is the San Andreas wrap cigar, but then also doing the Las Calaveras had a San Andreas this year. Uh, the Buckeye land is San Andreas cigars. We discussed and and the, and, and the court reserve with a San Andreas wrap. Was there any concern about having too much congestion with that particular uh, wrapper uh, in your portfolio? Well, I, I think there's always that concern, right? You don't want to, you don't want, especially for us, we love mixing it up, right? A lot of our blends, very, very few times they share similar wrappers, right? I mean, it's sure. just it's not something we traditionally do, but the Jericho Hill has always been Mexican San Andreas, but it's never been that deep, deep Mexican San Andreas. It's always been a little bit more of a Colorado in color. And Pepin Garcia um, knocked that blend out the box. I think Jericho Hill, I get probably more compliments on Jericho Hill than any blend that we do. People rave about Jericho Hill. But that's always been a staple in our brand, right? So if you want Mexican San Andreas and you want Crown Heads, Jericho Hill is always there for you. But this year being the fifth anniversary of Las Calaveras, we, I, John and I talked. I said, you know, I really want to highlight this because of my family. I'm Mexican-American. And um, uh, we, we do celebrate Las Calaveras. And, and that's something that's always been in the back of my mind is, Las Calaveras, it is one of our signature brands and blends that we release every year, but it's never had a Mexican wrapper. So we felt like this being the fifth anniversary, now is the time to do it. From the green band, which is completely different, really represents, I think, Mexico and that brightness of the color and the, and the life of what Las Calaveras is. Um, uh, Dia de los Muertos kind of feel to it. Uh, and so, and then that wrapper definitely represents Mexico. And had a, just a beautiful San Andreas Maduro wrapper. Pepin made for makes that for us as well, but it's a different priming from Jericho Hill, right? Because sometimes okay. we all think about wrappers being the same, but Jericho Hill you have a lower priming, and Las Calaveras you had a higher priming. And then with CHC Reserve being a Mexican San Andreas, that was Ernesto Perez Carrillo's take on 
his his feel for Las for for a Mexican San Andreas. So, and then with Buckeye Land, it's that Willie. was Willie Herrera's take right. on Mexican San Andreas. So, if everyone was making it at the same factory, if it was the same priming, yes. But they're all different primings. They're three different manufacturers, and I think they each. I think as as, as you could probably attest to, they are all very different and i am a sucker for mexican san andreas i think it's been probably the most underrepresented rapper in the industry for decades i mean i think it's very in vogue right now but i think people forget that 10 years ago it was not a cool thing no. mexican tobacco it probably hasn't been cool to use mexican tobacco since the 60s and 70s so i think this rapper is finally getting its due and i think guys like pepin i think guys like Pete Johnson, I think guys like John Huber, Crown Heads, I think guys like Willie Herrera, I think them and amongst others, Ernesto being one of them, is spearheading Mexican San Andreas and saying, we're proud to use it and, and you're going to love it. And so I don't think you can ever have too much Mexican San Andreas. Um, I think it's it's been a success for you guys, to be honest. Like I Like I... Like I said, I think there was – I wanted to know if there was some concern on the forefront, but I, I like that you guys pushed it through and obviously to, to, to much success because each cigar is very unique, has very unique characteristics. Uh, the Court Reserve in particular to me uh, is probably one of the mo – if, if not the, uh, one of the most unique cigars with that wrapper on it uh, that I've, I've, I've smoked, if not in recent memory, probably ever. Um, it just is – completely different than any yeah, San Andreas it, cigar that you've ever smoked. The Mexican San Andreas doesn't play the lead on that cigar. I think it plays a a instrument, right? It, I think it it's not the lead singer in the band right. in CHC. I think it's the backup singer to the blend. And I think in in the 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 Buckeye, I think it's a lead singer in that blend. So I, I think it's it's very interesting how you can kind of play with wrappers and depending on filler and binder, how you play off that wrapper. Um, truly, I think there's probably, in my humble opinion, I think we have probably 10, maybe 10 truly master blenders in this industry. And I, I honestly believe that Willie Pepin with his son Jaime and Ernesto Perez Carrillo are in that 10. And we're very blessed to have them working together with crown heads we're very blessed to work with them and so um what we do is we try to create great blends and great cigars but we can't do that without the partnerships that we have and um we just feel very blessed to be able to do what we do every day and on behalf mm -hmm. of john huber and mike connor the two owners of, of crown heads um we just feel very blessed to do what we do day in and day out so um, it's truly a joy, man. Truly a joy. Yes. And, and thank you, Miguel. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. That, uh, that's going to, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. But just as a final note on that, I think that's, that's very indicative of the talent of the blending. When you can have a rapper that plays second fiddle, so to speak, plays a more complimentary role rather than a dominant role that really speaks to the talent behind the blending in, uh, in Carrillo's case there with the court reserve. So, uh, absolutely fantastic point. Um, and so I, I would really like to thank our guest this evening, Miguel Shadal. Thank you so much for your time. I had no idea that you're flying out at three o'clock this morning uh, <laughs> to get to uh, the home base in Nashville. So uh, even I'm already grateful for your time, but even more so now having uh, having heard that from you that uh, that you're going to be flying out in just a few short hours. So definitely, definitely appreciate your time. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, I'm thank you for here. having me on the show, and I appreciate what you do. Keep doing what you're doing. And um, I look forward to hopefully being back with you um, whenever, whenever you know you call on me. I'm there for you, man. You work Appreciate hard, that. and I love what you do. And um, I, I just, I wish, I hope the best for you, brother. And and I know you got the Casa Cuevas Fact uh, uh, Studio over there. They're a great family, and uh, you just got you're surrounded by a lot of great people. So, man, cheers to you, and cheers to your viewers, man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, I do have. We do have some of the best viewers. Uh, I am biased, of course. Do have some of the best uh, fans out there, and really appreciate everyone who watched tonight. And we'll catch the replay later on. Um, and yes, 
Got to thank uh, absolutely um, our wonderful sponsors of Casa Cuevas for the Casa Cuevas Studios here of Euless, Texas. Like you said, great family, great people. Uh, really enjoy working with them as well. So, uh, And uh, for all of you guys out there, really appreciate all your likes, shares, and comments. Uh, please keep them coming. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't had the, uh, the opportunity to do so. Like us on Facebook at El Oso Fumar. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at El Oso Fumar. And we really appreciate it. And we'll see you in two weeks. Actually taking a week off. We'll see you in two weeks. Mr. Robert Holt will be joining us for Take 58 of Southern Draw Cigars. And that will be here in two weeks live on Sunday at 930 Central. I'm really excited to be sit down with Robert. Check our Check up our, our Facebook page for upcoming schedule in addition with uh, other guests that are coming up, as well as our top 10 cigars of 2018, which will be our first show in 2019. I know a lot of you are excited to hear um, what I thought were my top 10 cigars for 2018. There will be some new parameters, some new rules, and I'll be releasing those here in the coming weeks. And so you guys will see that as well. So really appreciate everyone for staying on board tonight. Really big thanks to Miguel for staying with us as well as he parts, uh, departs uh, fl sunny Florida for uh, beautiful Nashville here in just a few short hours. And we thank all of you out there. Again, my name is Barry Duplissy. This was Elo Sofumar Takes. Take 57, our 57 take. Yes, this has been 57 marvelous, marvelous takes. And I've had two privileged ones with my guest right here, Miguel Shodell. I'm live from the Casa Cuevas studios of Euless, Texas. And guess what? We'll see you next time.